the thing I want you to remember here is that it is not possible to separate the ecology of the rainforest from the ecology of the rivers, from the ecology of the sea. It's not three different ecosystems. It is one living system. The salmon fertilizes this forest. The salmon go up all of these little streams all throughout the Great Bear Rainforest, and the wolves and the eagles and the ravens and the bears eat them, and they do their droppings throughout, and they'll take, and, and they, this is why you find all these monstrous, uh, you know, monumental cedars up and down all of these streams. So the, the DNA of the forest is the same as the DNA of the salmon that we have. The DNA of the First Nations people live there is exactly the same as the trees. We all live and breathe and grow on the same thing. That's what we have as a treasure that the coastal First Nations are more than willing to share with the rest of the world. Five years ago, we celebrated the achievement of this world-class model of sustainability that really meshes uh, environment and human well-being and economic prosperity uh, across that entire rainforest ecosystem. When we celebrated the, the gift to the earth, it was really for us about celebrating that model. And when we celebrated that, we raised our sights and we said, because this whole region depends on the health of all of these ecosystems, what we need to do is to take this model out into the ocean and to extend the model of sustainability into the sea so that we are not only meshing jobs and environment and healthy communities, we are building a model that really reflects that interconnection between land and sea, between rainforest and ocean. But now we're at a place where all of this work, our 20 years of, of work in this region, all of the science work that we've done, and that model of sustainability are, uh, well, they're about to be overshadowed. Not that many people in the room who aren't familiar with the proposed Northern Gateway Pipeline. Um, it's a pipeline project to carry uh, bitumen from the oil sands at, uh, in Edmonton um, across uh, half of Alberta, across all of British Columbia, uh, to the BC coast. It's a massive proposal. Um, we're looking at just shy of 1,200 kilometers of pipeline. We talk about it as a pipeline, but it's actually two pipelines. What we have is one pipeline that carries a condensate mix from west to east, uh, and, so that, and then the condensate is mixed with the bitumen, so the bitumen is liquid enough to flow in a pipe, and then that diluted bitumen flows back from east to west, uh, crossing uh, the Rockies, crossing the Coast Mountain Range, uh, crossing uh, over 800 rivers and streams, uh, including the headwaters of the Fraser, um, and coming to arrive at Kitimat, um, of course, bisecting the Great Bear. And then from Kitimat, we see the routes where the oil tankers that are gathering this um, oil travel out through a sort of series of narrow winding channels and some very difficult navigation in order to come out into Hecate Strait, uh, which is one of the world's most treacherous oceans. The headline grabbing risk always is the possibility of a catastrophic oil spill. These tankers would be carrying is not crude oil, which floats, but diluted bitumen, which separates into a toxic gas that can actually prevent cleanup efforts because it's too, it's too hazardous for people to be in the region for a few days while this da gas dissipates. And then the bitumen itself, which sinks. So there is no technology in the world that can clean up a spill like this. Even before there's a spill, the risks for this region are significant because really what we're talking about is taking one of the world's great wild places and turning it into an industrial zone. The choice for us is not about protecting a place from development. This place is wild, but it is by no means a wilderness. It's very much a working landscape. So we're not out there saying don't do any development in our territory. We're busy trying to develop a sustainable economy, and all of these little pieces are necessary components of that. We're not stuck in the past. We recognize that the ancient culture that we have has to be married with, with a new culture and that we have to develop an economy that is current. We've always done that. We did that with the fur trade. We did that with fishing. We're not afraid to be part of a new economy, but we're afraid of one that's going to destroy the economy that we've already created. The model that is on the line right now is our choice between doing this, all of these activities, in a way that can sustain and respect the ecosystems, that can continue to contribute to the health of the ocean and to the rainforest, or in one fell swoop, putting all of that at risk. All of my family lives in this area. Uh, I have a few kids. I have 16 grandchildren that live and breathe in, in that area. They range in age from 19 to one year old. 
and that my life's work is to make sure that they have a future. But I think it's, it's also my life's work to make sure that your children have a future as well. So I guess the question is what can we do? Well, as Coastal First Nations, this is a project that the federal government has put so high up on the radar that if we don't have support from Canadians and the rest of British Columbians, that this project will end up being a war on the coast. And we don't want that. We want Canadians to tell our federal government that they should back off on this project. There is nothing more Canadian than standing up for the protection of our fish and our rivers and our wildlife and for the protection of some of our country's most stunning landscapes. It's our moment to choose a future that really does represent that model of sustainability that will keep this place in our country for generations forever.